of, of what we'll be doing today. So uh, Sibony can go to the next slide. We'll be doing introductions right before each speaker talks. So first of all, there is a, a question and answer option. So you can type your, your questions into the, the Q&A box. And we'll also be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with the event recording and relevant links. So don't feel that you need to, to write down any of the points. We will, we will be uh, making sure that you get those and they'll be easy for you to just click on. We also encourage you to tweet what you're learning today. We are at sustain underscore CLT and we'll be using hashtag safe transit and transit is essential along with other transportation and transit advocacy organizations across the country. Now, if we go to the next slide, I want to briefly tell you a little bit about Sustain Charlotte. We are a nonprofit organization based in the community, and we are dedicated to engaging, educating, and uniting citizens to solve Charlotte's sustainability challenges. We inspire choices that lead to a healthy, equitable, and vibrant community for generations to come. And since we were founded back in 2010, we've been working to lift up the needs of all people in the Charlotte area to be connected to opportunities and, and be able to access the full range of benefits that our great community offers, all without the need to own a car. So we have uh, an incredible team who have been working hard behind the scenes to bring this event to you. Sibony and Mary Catherine and, and Tariq and Eric are all with us today and they're making sure that, that things run smoothly. So if we go to the next slide, I want to talk a bit about the overall national effort that this event is a part of. This event is part of the National Campaign for Transit Justice, which is a coalition of more than 15 transit regions organized and supported by the Alliance for a Just Society, the Natural Resources Defense Council, Transit Center, and Transportation for America in coordination with the Bloomberg Philanthropies American Cities Climate Challenge. And we're really working together to support federal transit funding, funding by really centering the needs and priorities of transit riders and the services that they depend on and the jobs that, that transit support. So we're really excited to be part of a, a national effort. So if we go to the next slide, there are some transit justice principles that all of the members of the National Campaign for Transit Justice are really trying to lift up, really five key principles of, of equitable transit. So the very first one is equitable transit. We know that America has a very car-based transportation system currently that erects barriers to mobility and that really reinforces long-term social inequities. We also need transit that is sustainable. We know that to, to avert severe climate change, models show that we need to, we need to shift a lot of car trips to, to transit trips. Um, transit needs to be economically productive. It needs to connect workers to jobs and, and uh, give employers access to the workforce. Many uh, work, workforce dynamics have changed as a result of COVID and essential workers and, and workers who are needing to find jobs in new locations often are facing difficult economic challenges in their households. And so we really need transit more than ever to make sure that people are not disconnected from opportunities. Transit also needs to be safe and accessible. We need safe streets for, for pedestrians because most of us are pedestrians when we ride transit. We're, most people are accessing transit stops either by bicycle or on foot. We need safe ways to cross the street to get to and from those transit stops. We need non-discriminatory policing policies. We need lighting, all of the elements that make our transit safe. And uh, we also need our, our transit to be affordable. Access to transit should, should uh, be available to everyone. So if we go to the, the next slide, uh, we are joining together with the other members of the National Campaign for Transit Justice in supporting an ask for $32 billion in immediate funding relief for transit to support operations in the next COVID relief or stimulus bill, as well as looking out longer term for uh, reauthorization of at least 105 billion over five years. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Alma Adams. She represents North Carolina's 12th congressional district. I first uh, saw her speak at a transit event with the US Secretary of Transportation and uh, former Charlotte Mayor Anthony Fox. And I remember just being impressed by how, how passionate she was about public transportation. Well, thank, thank you very much. And good afternoon, Charlotte. How's everyone? I hope you had a great uh, Thanksgiving and that it was safe <clears throat> and um, that uh, in the 
the midst of, of, of the uh, 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 coronavirus, uh, we were still able to have some interaction, uh, even if it was virtual with your families. But before I begin, I do want to uh, give a special shout out to my mayor, who I understand uh, uh, had to uh, not had to be away, uh, to Mayor Von Lyles and to all the other participants uh, of the forum, to uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Julie Isel, to the Davidson Mayor Rusty Knox, Charlotte Family Housing Executive Director Pedro uh, Perez, and the Southern Environmental Law Center's uh, Kim Hunter. Uh, thank you all so much for the work that you do, uh, for your service to our community. It is the rent we pay uh, for living on this earth. Uh, you're doing uh, so much to make our community better. And I do want to uh, thank uh, Sustain Charlotte for convening the meeting today. Uh, to the former mayor, Harvey Gant, and to the entire uh, Charlotte's MOVE task force uh, as well for the hard work that they do. Uh, it is uh, extremely encouraging to see uh, everyone's commitment to improving our infrastructure here at home. Unfortunately, we can no longer talk about tra uh, transportation policy or any other policy without talking about COVID-19. The uh, coronavirus pandemic has had a devastating impact on our families, our communities, our healthcare system, our economy, and our schools. But I am hopeful that this time next year, that we'll be able to build on this conversation in person, free from COVID-19. Uh, and so as we work towards a new normal, uh, we have to take the lessons learned from this pandemic and apply them to moving forward. And as when we talk about moving forward, clearly transportation uh, must be a part of that. And so as I think, uh, I think uh, that everyone here would agree that one of the most important takeaways from this virus is that a, a robust public transportation system is critical to the well being of our community and region. Uh, I'm back in Washington today. As a matter of fact, the uh, House will be voting a little bit uh, later uh, today, and we'll be working all week, and hopefully, we'll be able uh, to come, come away uh, before <clears throat> we leave here for good. Uh, with uh, the support for our communities and particularly as it relates to the transportation that we are all concerned about. And so at the height of the pandemic, we saw uh, firsthand how critical a, a strong transit system is for many in our community, including for our essential workers. Uh, I have a particular interest in essential workers. Uh, I do uh, chair the Workforce um, uh, Protections um, Committee that's a part of the Ed and Labor Committee. And so uh, the essential workers come under uh, that committee and, and we wanna make sure uh, that they are safe. And so many of those workers, uh, even though many of us are at home and have an opportunity to work from home, uh, many of our essential workers depend on our transit system to commute to work and to reach other essential services. So many in our community have stepped up during this pandemic and I certainly thank all of the, the citizens of Charlotte who have pitched in, including uh, CATS, which went the, the extra mile and they offered free rides to help alleviate some of the burdens brought about by the virus. But before COVID-19, CATS trans transported over 30, 320,000 individuals a week, imagine that. 320,000 individuals a week. Those numbers are down temporarily, but like everywhere else, uh, they have started to rebound. But I think as we are able to recapture uh, some of our job, some of the job loss and so forth, uh, people will still have to get to work. But still, the, the fact of the matter is that CATS, like, like many transit agencies, need our help more than ever. Our region partners need our help. And we certainly can't, can't forget about our world-class airport and its workers uh, uh, as well, because they too uh, need our help. And so the need for a strong regional transportation system will continue long after COVID-19 is gone. And we, we, we're saying that, and it's, it's been said that we can see some light uh, <clears throat> at the end of the tunnel and that help is on the way. And cer certainly I believe that and we look forward to it. Uh, essential workers still need to get to work. Residents still need to be able to access each opportunity that our great region offers. 
And in Mecklenburg, that means being able to, to wake up in Matthews, work in Charlotte, get ice cream in Davidson, and travel to the Charlotte Doug Douglas uh, Airport without ever having to get behind a wheel. A strong public transportation network will raise home values in the immediate vicinity while creating new sites for affordable housing, bring millions of, uh, millions of dollars and opportunity to local businesses, reduce families, transportation budgets, and slash carbon emissions, and reduce our overall climate footprint. Uh, across our region, transit is the future. And that's why in Congress, I've been able to continue to fight for transit dollars and help fund projects critical to continuing our, our connecting our region and providing opportunity for all of our residents. In March, Congress successfully passed the CARES Act, uh, which provides $25 billion for public transportation purposes. Uh, we, uh, CATS received about 50 million from that pot. And now though, as these funds run low and Americans and businesses need additional stimulus to make it through uh, these last few months, the House has passed an updated HEROES Act to provide uh, additional relief. Our bill, which includes an additional 32 billion for public transit agents agencies would help ensure that public transit agencies can keep buses, trains clean, safe and in operation. So now we need the Senate to do their part to provide much needed relief. And we're working, uh, trying to make sure that we're able to reach uh, certainly um, uh, a package that will relieve uh, some of the burdens we have in our community. But beyond COVID-19 COVID relief packages, I've worked with uh, Transportation uh, Appropriations Chair, my colleague, David Price, who is uh, in the North Carolina delegation uh, to help secure funding increases for the Capital Investment Grant, uh, uh, the, the SIG program. Uh, that program is how Charlotte secured federal funds to build the Blue Line. I've also worked with the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee uh, Chairman uh, Peter DeFazio to include my STAR Act, which is Saving Transit Art Resources, to allow local transit entities to incorporate art into federally funded transit projects. But still, we have a lot that we can do. Uh, a few months ago, Congress reauthorized the FAST Act our transportation authority uh, authorization bill for another year. As you know, the former Secretary of Transportation, um, uh, Mr. Fox did a lot of work uh, when he was here uh, on, uh, on that FAST Act. So as we go into the new Congress with uh, President Biden, uh, I will be working with uh, Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Price, and the Secretary of Transportation to help secure all of the funding that I can for our region. As always, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to my office if we can be of assistance to you. And again, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be uh, a part of this important conversation. And I want you to remember, keep your social distancing, uh, wear your mask and wash your hands, and, and, and we can beat this virus together. I know we're going to do it. So I'm happy to answer a few questions that you might have before uh, I have to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Adams. If anybody has a question, you could type it into the chat box. I don't think that the, the Q&A function is working right now. You might want to do it and raise your hand. <laughs> we could do that. Okay, I see here a question from uh, David Borax. He's asking, how does the $105 billion allocation break down? So I believe he's referring to um, a, a uh, federal reauthorization of uh, surface. Well, I just uh, referred to, uh, uh, to my staff here who says 80-20. That's the breakdown. Um, and um, half of it goes to uh, public transportation. Thank you. Which we're going to need. I mean, Charlotte is growing. 
Uh, and I think it's going to help us in a lot of respects because if you can get keep people out of the automobiles, first of all, you're going to cut down on the accidents and all the traffic. Uh, but probably you're going to be able to get around a lot faster. Now, I live in Plaza Midwood, and uh, they're putting the rail through there. They've been working on it three or four years. So <laughs> it looks like they're nearing uh, finishing that. And so I think we're going to, once we can get people up and out again, it, it's going to be a great opportunity for our city and, and our region. And our region. I see Mayor uh, Knox out there. How you doing, sir? Thank you. I see a question from Nancy asking, will preference be given to those who espouse green and clean energy? Uh, we're trying to do that. Um, certainly, um, we are all we are all concerned about the environment, and if we're not, we should be uh, for the future of not only our communities but for our children. But yes, there's been a lot of talk, even by our uh, president elect, about uh, clean energy and so forth. So yeah, I I I, I can tell you that that's uh, going to be a topic of discussion. There's a question from Stephen. Where do you see transportation reauthorization weighing in regarding pedestrian and cycling access to transit hubs and for continuous pathways as an alternative to driving? Well, we're, we're talking about that as well. And you know, as I am driving around, even in, in Charlotte, um, I do see a number of uh, of uh, bikeways and so forth. And again, that's a, that's a great way for people to get around and we want people to be able to uh, get out to see the city and also uh, use uh, biking as an opportunity for exercise and all the other things that we need to do that we haven't been able to do as a result of COVID. So that too is a part of the transportation. I think what we're going to see is a comprehensive approach uh, to how we can get people from one place to the other. And uh, that we can we can do that safely, and I think that that's uh, that's an issue that we're going to always be concerned about. Okay. And Tanisha asked, I may have missed this, but what project is first on your agenda? Oh, that's first on my agenda. That's first on your agenda. Well, I think if we can if we can uh, get this virus under control, I think that will help us in terms of our economy. We've lost a lot of jobs. Uh, I'm very concerned about our small businesses and other folks who uh, have lost out because we, they, they've had to uh, 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 scale down their businesses and so forth. So I think if we can lick this virus and it looks like, as uh, Dr. Fauci has said, help is on the way. And we've seen that um, we, we perhaps will have a vaccine pretty soon, uh, that I think that's going to help us. Once we can do that, then we can get people back out uh, in the opening. So that's one of the things that we're concentrating on right now. But in terms of, of, of transportation, we're going to try to uh, make sure that we um, complete the, the dollar requests that, that uh, Mecklenburg needs to finish um, the various projects that it, it has um, going on in terms of the, the, the silver line, the blue line, and all those things that were underway that have been abruptly um, halted because of uh, COVID-19. Thank you, I couldn't agree more. And I think we have time for one more question. Dean asks, how do we incorporate electric vehicles in our transit plans? I think that CATS recently decided to buy electric buses going forward. Well, I'm sorry, what was the question again? How do we incorporate electric vehicles in our transit plans? I think that CATS decided to buy electric buses going forward. Well, I think that was smart of CATS to do that. And uh, that is in, in the bills that we're working on. Uh, so um, it, people are concerned about it and see it as, a, as, a, as an option and an opportunity for us to not only keep our environment cleaner, but um, uh, it, it gives people another alternative that they can use. And so I don't have an electric uh, vehicle right now, uh, but um, uh, you know, I may be looking at one in the future as well. But, but one of the things I'll say that it, with our North Carolina delegation, uh, we're very fortunate to have on the appropriations uh, committee, um, uh, uh, David Price, uh, Con Con Congressman David Price, 
whose area of funding in terms of appropriations is transportation. So he and I will be working very closely together along with other members of the delegation. So uh, we'll make sure that this is front and center uh, that these issues that are, that are coming forward um, for Charlotte, for Mecklenburg and, and for the rest of our, our state. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Adams, not only for joining us today and, and sharing your passion for public transit, but for your ongoing leadership on this critical issue. We're so grateful for that. Well, thank it's you. now my pleasure to introduce Charlotte Mayor Pro Tem Julie Isolt. Mayor Pro Tem Isolt not only chairs the Transportation Planning and Environment Committee, she also represents all of the needs of Charlotte residents as an at-large council member. What I really appreciate about Mayor Pro Tem Isolt is she asks the tough questions and she recognizes that, that Charlotte is growing rapidly and we need to meet the needs of our residents through uh, transportation and land use planning. So I really, really appreciate the effort that she puts into learning deeply about the issues on the committee that she chairs. So Mayor Pro Tem Isolt. Thank you, Meg. Thoughts with us. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be with you all today because I do feel really passionate about how uh, transportation and transit can absolutely transform our region. And as Mayor Knox knows, we've all got in, in Congresswoman Adams, we have got to think of this as a region because we have opportunities for people to live here, but they can't all live in downtown Davidson or downtown Charlotte. And we've got to give people options to live maybe a little bit further out, but still be able to get to work, get to school, get to the services they need efficiently, predictably, and affordably. And that means that we need good transit. And we can't possibly do it without uh, putting together a regional partnership. Uh, that means with you know, all the towns and working together in collaboration with our state leadership and our federal leadership. So I really um, am anxious or excited, I should say, to see the efforts that are going into um, doing that together, supported by the amazing uh, citizen organizations like Sustain Charlotte, because as we know, if the citizens aren't asking for it and aren't really driving these efforts, we're not gonna get them done. So thank you for the great work that you guys are doing. Um, we have, um, I know Mayor Lyles really wanted to be here today because this is absolutely a passion project for her um, to work on our transformational mobility network for Charlotte Mecklenburg region. She's actually in Raleigh today on transit related business. So that's where we need her. The transformational mobility network for the Charlotte region is something that we've been working on through the Charlotte Moves Task Force. And what that is, is it's really looking at our integrated multimodal network of all different ways that you can get around bike, pedestrian, uh, bus, uh, light rail, cars, and really making it into a network that takes into account the health, the safety of our citizens, equity, access to opportunity, in, and take it into consideration in the framework of our regional growth and how that um, how that's all going to connect. Um, we want to provide those safe and equitable options for mobility for all travelers, no matter what their age is, their income level, their abilities, uh, and their race and where they live. We don't want anyone to feel as if they don't have the same options that others have. And, and the, the key is having options, not just one mode to uh, get to where they need to go. And we want to do that through an integrated system of bikes, sidewalks, as I mentioned, trails, um, as well. So some of the things that that our Charlotte Moves Task Force has looked at when they as assessed our transformational mobility network is with regards to health, how close are people to grocery stores? Right now, it's, you know, the goal is to be within a half mile of a transformational mobility network. In other words, have access within a half mile to some form of transportation to get to a grocery store. I just heard a statistic that nationally, it, the, the average trip to a grocery store is 40 minutes. And that's just not acceptable. That's a national number. That's not our number. So we hope to have ours much more reasonable. Um, increasing the share of trips made without a car to get to grocery stores, to get to services, uh, the doctor's office to work um, is another goal of the transformational mobility network. 
And then from the, from the standpoint of equity and access to opportunity, we looked at increasing access in our historically underinvested communities with modes of transportation that support equitable and affordable mobility options. So um, within that, we hope that our, our future transformational network, 92% of the population is served by other forms of multimodal uh, transformation. So that's the goal. Right now it's at about 56%. Um, jobs, we hope that we have a transformational network that gives people access to, um, again, transportation within a half mile so that they can get to, uh, to jobs at not just one income spec, uh, point on the income on the spectrum of income, but they have options for jobs as well. So all of these things really play into having a fully integrated system of different transportation options. And um, what the difficult part is going to be is the funding. Right now, we are working very hard. As I said, that's what the mayor is working on as we speak on working uh, at the state level, but also the federal level in collaboration to um, come up with a full package of funding, which we anticipate could be anywhere from eight to $12 billion. And the funding model works such that our local portion would be roughly four to $6 billion. And we are looking at possibly having a bond next year, referendum for um, our the local portion in Mecklenburg County of possibly an increase in our sales tax so that we can leverage that with state and federal uh, sources of funds. There's also efforts going on at the state level that are separate from um, what we're doing locally to find different sources of funding for transportation because as any of the transportation experts know, the sources of funding for of revenue for transportation have been going away. It's been primarily our, the gas tax and that really has flattened out. Um, it's even worse during COVID. So we've I sit on a commission called NC First that's looking at new sources of revenue to uh, fund the transportation needs of the future. And I think that you, you, what you're gonna see is that there's going to be a tremendous amount of, um, of effort put on, put in at the state level to fund transportation and at the and transportation being potholes, sidewalks, existing roads and, and highways. And then here at the local level for transit, for new sources of, um, uh, 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 options for mobility within the framework of our transformational uh, mobility network. Um, so, and then what we're doing locally, that's kind of sort of the big picture, but what we've been working on locally at the Charlotte level is two things. From a planning standpoint, we were working on, anybody who follows city, um, the work of the city council, we knew that we had to unify all of our different development ordinances that had been sort of layered uh, in one big book over the course of you know years and years and probably a hundred years, and we needed to put those uh, to redefine our development ordinances into what we call the UDO, the Unified Development Ordinance, to make it easier and and to communicate better what the rules are. But we needed to take a step back and and develop the comprehensive uh, plan, and and what that is is basically taking citizen input and saying, what do we want our community to look like? What do we want our city to look like? Where should schools be? How close should they be to parks? How close should residential neighborhoods be to grocery stores and services? But also within that, most importantly, is what is, what is the strategic mobility plan that addresses what I was just talking about? So how do we um, build a city that that puts our density, our increased density near our major transit corridors? So we've been working on that with um, you can Google Charlotte Future 2040. That's that's the um, initiative. We've been working on that for the past two years, and we hope that council will uh, adopt the plan coming up this spring. Um, that's going to be a major. We haven't done one since 1975. So as you, anybody who watches our zoning meetings know, we sort of go about haphazardly approving planning in this city in a very transactional way. And we want to get away from that. We want to, 
we want to come up with a comprehensive plan and map it out so that it is predictable and people can understand the city that we hope to build and how trans and how mobility works within that because that's going to be the most important thing that we do i believe in the next decade is to build out a strategic mobility plan that that allows people to have access to the goods and services, to the job opportunities that many people just don't have today. And we can take that and say that that's fine for where we are now as a city, but we also have to realize that by 2040, we're going to add about another 300,000 citizens to our community. So it's it's a huge undertaking. And I really appreciate everybody who's on the call today who is interested enough to be a part of that effort and give us the feedback. And we're going to really need you next next year as we move forward and try to figure out how to fund uh, these initiatives. Thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem Isol, for your leadership and for doing so much to help align the land use needs, the transportation needs, and doing all of it with, with a, a mind for equity and, and protecting our environment. We really appreciate what you do. I would now like to introduce Town of Davidson Mayor Rusty Knox. I know Mayor Davidson through his role as a delegate on the Metropolitan Transit Commission, which is the governing body of CATS, our transit agency. And and Mayor Knox is not only the mayor of Davidson, but he's also happens to be an accomplished singer and songwriter. And I saw a great, a great quote on his site that says, his songs are not intricate phrases filled with symbolism and metaphors, just good stories to listen to. And I think that's what Mayor Knox embodies. When the, the Metro Rapid Express buses began running between North Mecklenburg and Charlotte earlier this year, he invited residents to ride with him on the bus. He is a person who tells stories and brings the, the full experience of his life to his role as mayor. So uh, Mayor Knox, we'd love to hear your perspective. Thanks for those kind words, Meg. I'm not sure if I can live up to the hype, but uh, I, I, I want to thank Congressman Alma Adams and Mayor Pro Tem Julie Islet for participating today. I know that Vive really wanted to be here and First and foremost, I want to thank everyone with Sustained Charlotte for, for pulling this off because uh, this is no easy task to put any one of these things together. So thank you guys so much for the hard work that you did. Um, to what Meg said, I do like telling stories. And let me, let me tell you a little story. And, and you, these are plug and play numbers. You can, I, I represent Davidson, which is the, the, the far extreme of North Mecklenburg. We have three communities up here, Davidson, Cornelius, and Huntersville. Our population in 2000 was 44,141 people based on the census for our three towns. It's estimated right now that we're at 110,000. That's 150% growth in 20 years. Now you take those numbers and plug them into West Mech, East Mech, or South Mech, and you're gonna see the same thing. This is why the conversation around transit and transportation is a regional effort. It's not just gridlock here in North Mecklenburg. You know, we, we, uh, we did open up two more lanes on 77 a few years ago for managed toll lanes. And again, you can't pave your way out of traffic. It, we could have added eight lanes that were general purpose and they would have been filled up. Um, the, the, the key, in, in transportation for us as, as a county is the connectivity between one place and the other. In Davidson, I, we're a town of about 14,000 people. 650 of my residents actually work in Davidson. 3,900 of my residents leave Davidson every day to work elsewhere. But the, the really interesting thing is almost 5,000 people a day come into Davidson to work every day. So there, there are some exponential needs right there just in this small little 14,000 person community that says transit would be a great option to move people in and out of this town. Um, we've got a rail corridor that runs north and south that bisects the three communities up here uh, that is all but abandoned at this point. It's the perfect format for, for doing a commuter rail system. 23 years ago, I got on the train here in Davidson that was the inception of what was gonna be a commuter rail service at some point in the future. And that's the last time pedestrians had been on this rail corridor. 
So that's one thing that we need to move towards in the future. But I think when we look uh, community-wide at transportation, you, you look at, at, at sitting on the MTC commission, I, you, you look at what CATS does with not only the bus services and enhanced bus services, as, as Meg alluded to, the, uh, uh, the express bus service that we launched last February. I did a ride with Rusty thing to launch it on the first day. And, you know, it, it, it's a 30 minute ride to Charlotte. And that's great because it picks you up at the, at the three transit centers up here and takes you in the, in the managed lanes right into the heart of the, heart of the city. And, and that's great. Uh, as, as we move forward, we're building a new transit center, the interconnectivity that we will have with ride shares and bikes and, and other types of e-vehicles and things are, are gonna be so important. Uh, the one thing that I, I thought was such a good move with CATS was moving towards electric buses. And this is gonna be a partnership with Duke Energy, um, but moving towards that reduced carbon footprint that Vi has talked about uh, in depth uh, is going to be so important when we take the bus fleet to to all e vehicles at, at some point. But I think that you know that the, when when you look at a vibrant transit community, you're talking about multimodal paths. We we are. I'm doing a dedication in the morning for a pedestrian bridge that connects a Greenway in Davidson to a Greenway in Cornelius. That Greenway in Cornelius is already connected to a Greenway in Huntersville. So I'm, I'm a third of the way to Charlotte on a greenway right now without, without ever getting on a paved road. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, there, there, there's so many other avenues besides just getting behind the wheel of a car. And, and that dialogue has to change because we're growing. And, and Julie, you can attest to this. We're, we're putting 300,000 people a year into our region right now. And, and, and as we grow, we've got to find a better way to move people that, that's not only more viable and more sustainable, but more economical for the workforce that moves throughout our county. Selfishly, the rail is right in my backyard. I live on Main Street in Davidson. And I would love to get on a, a, a light rail or a commuter rail and go down to Fuda Buddha and eat noodles on my lunch hour and come back. And one day I hope to be able to do that. And for those of you that know what I'm talking about on South Boulevard, you, you can appreciate that. But it, it, it's important for us as a community to be able to not only enjoy Pineville, Matthews, Mint Hill, uh, Davidson, Cornelius, and Huntersville, but also enjoy what Charlotte has to offer. And, and, and when I say enjoy, enjoy doesn't have to be going to the arts and going to sporting events. Enjoy can be the peace of mind that I can go back and forth to my job without being stuck for an hour and 20 minutes on the interstate. And, and, and so as we move forward, this dialogue has to change. The dynamic thought pattern has to change about how we move around and what's important. And, and the more we expand our transit system, the better our quality of life is going to be. And that's for all of us. So again, I, I want to thank you, Meg, for folding me into this. Uh, this is this it's a really important conversation. I, I, I know every time I open my mouth at MTC, John Lewis cringes because he's no he knows I'm going right for this rail corridor every time. But one day Norfolk Southern will will free this corridor up and we'll put some people on these tracks and move them back and forth. So uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Knox, for lifting up the importance of connectivity between Charlotte and the towns of Mecklenburg County. That's so critical. And even though Sustained Charlotte has, it, our, our name has Charlotte in it, we recognize that the work that we do does not stop at the city limits of Charlotte. It doesn't even stop at the, the borders of Mecklenburg County. We really need to think about our entire region and how people can stay connected to opportunities to work and, and play and and learn. So thank you so much for, for that leadership. We're gonna take a, a little transition now to view some videos from people who are champions for transit in our community. You're going to hear from Chrissy and India and Sherry, and they each share a perspective about why transit is important to their communities. So Eric is going to start sharing his screen and we'll watch those videos.
So my name is Chrissy Exlin, and I am the chair of CATS Transit Services Advisory Committee and a daily transit rider. I have taken transit for most of my adult life. Um, the short time that I did have to drive was unpleasant because it's exhausting to have to drive and worry about not hitting the car in front of you and where you're going to park and how much it's going to cost and do I have enough gas to get home. Um, I, I think that public transit is freedom. It's freedom from the responsibility of having to drive a car. Um, it's, there's other reasons that it's, it's great. It's a lower impact on the environment. It's, it's cheaper. Um, I think it helps you get to know a city uh, by being around people on the bus. You're all trying to get to the same place. But for me, really the, the most attractive part about public transportation is just, it's one less thing I have to do in my day. I show up at the bus stop, the bus takes me where I need to go. And I don't have to worry about a car and the responsibilities and costs associated with a car. Um, and I, I just think that transit is freedom. It gets you places. Um, as everybody knows, we have Cam North ends and um, we have a lot of neighbors who are transient who use the transit system. And um, I think it would be awesome to have uh, more access to downtown, more access to other areas of the North End. I, I wish we had a little bit of a better system to get to the transit and and to get to, um, you know, the West End. We got Betty's Four that isn't too far. And, I, I you know, I, I do a lot of commuting over there. So a lot of people in North End are very connected to the West End. Um, and I don't really see that I can think of easy access to that side of town as well. So I feel like we're so close to everything and so close to downtown, but we're so far away from everything. It's so much extra work and so much extra, you know, physicality of it. You know, if we're, we're talking about uptown being the last kind of, area that needs that economic push and to, to help the restaurants, well, we can't get down there easily. So how are we going to get there? My name is Sherry Thompson. I do not own a car and I do not drive. So transit is my main mode of transportation. Here in Charlotte, I use public transportation for all of my needs to go to the grocery store, to go to the doctors, to go to all of my meetings, to go to the VA, all of the areas that I need to go to to live an independent life. So transit for me is really a very crucial thing in my life to keep me independent. I can, if I did not have the transit, it would be difficult for me to live independently. So, I, you know, I, one thing I would encourage, just keep engaging, keep, talk, keep talking to people, you know, folks in the neighborhoods will keep connecting with folks as well to, you know, get input from especially the residents and uh, neighbors who who utilize the, the service. So. We love hearing directly from transit riders and community members who believe in the importance of transit. So we wanted to make sure that just a few of their, their voices were, were lifted up today, but there are, there are thousands, tens of thousands of, of stories just like theirs all across Charlotte Mecklenburg. So we're really grateful that they could be a part of our event. I would now like to introduce Charlotte Family Housing Executive Director, Pedro Perez. He, uh, Charlotte Family Housing empowers working families who are experiencing homelessness to achieve lifelong self-sufficiency through shelter, housing, supportive services, and advocacy. I'm also familiar with Mr. Perez's work on the Charlotte Moves Task Force. And what's so impressive is almost every meeting, he's asking those tough questions about equity and ensuring that the Charlotte Moves Task Force recommendation really helps to keep people housed. We know that housing alone is, is not an issue that happens in a vacuum. We, we know that people need access to affordable, accessible, efficient transportation. And Mr. Perez uh, is a, brings a great deal of experience to his role. He uh, rose to the rank of Brigadier General in the New York State Police. He also uh, is a professional conga drummer and performs internationally. And he holds some very high rankings in jujitsu and karate. So. 
Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Perez. Thank you. I'm, I am honored to be on Charlotte Moves Committee. I'm honored to be on this panel. And I'm honored to do this because transportation has always been critical. As I grew up in New York City, I had to take, I had to walk about a half a mile to the bus stop, which then took me another mile to the train station so that I can go and get an education. And then when I came to Charlotte and I looked at Charlotte's transportation system, and I saw that there was a, um, a spoken hub center, I realized how limiting that was. As I began to learn about Charlotte and learn about the communities that were not having access to resources that they needed in order to thrive. 98% of the families that we serve are working families that, that are experiencing homelessness. And part of their struggle is how do they move around the city to gain access to healthcare, education, and job opportunities and affordable housing. You know, this is the one of the crucial things that I think is important. What I value about the work that Charlotte Move is doing is that we're asking questions of our community members. We are looking to create a transformational system that is focused on equity. And equity is so critical. And that's why I'm constantly asking the question, for instance, how are we going to fund this? Are we going to use regressive taxes or are we going to use progressive means of funding it? What's that going to be? What kind of impact will that occur to the families we're trying to serve? You know, for instance, if we if we try to, uh, my concern is that if we raise uh, taxes for for these families proportionally, I could afford a two cent increase in sales tax, but could the family that I'm serving that just came out of homelessness afford that two cents? What their percentage of that of their income would go into paying for that? Can we create equitable fee structure? for the families that are working based on AMI and where they sit on, on the poverty scale or the wealth scale as it were. So those are the kinds of things that I think are, are critical. The other thing that's, that's important is that, that we create a system that does not disrupt communities. If we think about Robert Moses who began to develop the highway system in New York City that was modeled all around the country, it destroyed communities. And here in Charlotte, we know that for instance, 77 went through Brooklyn. And, and disrupted many other communities. And this conversation we're currently having is looking to not do things like that. It's looking to integrate and solidify and create a community-wide access to, to transportation. Moreover, recognizing that the car for many people is an extreme expense. The first thing I realized as I tried to register my car, I had to pay property tax on my car. That's an expense that I was not prepared. Now I could afford it, but I did not realize that because you don't have to pay that in New York State. So that was a concern I have with when we talk to our families. One of the main things that we do at Charlotte Family Housing, along with our three phase program, is we also try to educate them on how to how to utilize how to become financially literate to understand how they can then utilize the, their resources and gain greater access to higher paying jobs. You know, the minimum wage is still $7.25 in this state and across the country. How do we raise that for these families? And transportation is one of the key ways. For every dollar spent in transportation, we create the potential of $4 of economic development. And economic development, education, and access to healthcare and these kind of resources are so critical to our families and so critical to this community. This is why I'm proud to be a part of this panel. And I wanna to continue to advocate for ensuring that when we look at these plans and we look to fund these plans and we look to construct these plans, that we do so from that perspective. And that's one of the things that's so exciting because it is one of the pillars that is in fact part of Charlotte Move and this whole initiative. It's exciting to be a part of it. And, and I know that the families that, that I'm serving uh, are very much interested in being able to use public transportation. For instance, imagine if you don't have a car and you're a single mom with three babies trying to go to the laundromat during this period of time, how difficult that is. As we move into the winter, how much more difficult that is. And so if we create a more robust transportation, public transportation system that creates access for these families, we create greater economic development and we create more equity for our families. Thank you so much, Mr. Perez, for the work that you do, not only at Charlotte Family Housing, but also on the Charlotte Moves Task Force to really advocate for the, the needs of those families. I would now like to introduce Southern Environmental Law Center, Senior 
attorney Kim Hunter. Ms. Hunter is a tireless advocate for sustainable transportation in the southeastern United States. Um, if you're not familiar with Southern Environmental Law Center, they're a nonprofit organization that uses the power of the law to champion the environment of the North of the Southeast. Kim was one of the first people that I met when I began working here at Sustain Charlotte, and she really helped me to understand the deep connections between transportation and the health of my uh, health of the environment. I also came from an environmental background, and she was one of the people that really uh, helped to, to draw that connection. So she's an incredible resource for Sustain Charlotte and for the many organizations that are working on transportation and environmental issues across the Southeast. Thanks, Meg. Um, and I'll try and keep this short. I know we're running a little bit behind time, but um, transportation is just so important to uh, the Southern Environmental Law Center and the goals that we have in the Southeast. Um, and I'll just talk about two really briefly. One, of course, is climate change. And I'm sure most of you know, but some don't, that transportation is actually the leading cause of climate change in the United States now. It has surpassed the power sector and it is headed to be the number one cause in North Carolina soon, uh, very soon. So if we're not thinking about transportation, when we think about climate change, uh, we're just not going to solve the, the climate crisis that we are in. And uh, that means, you know, everything from the federal state to the local level, everyone who has a climate plan, like I know Charlotte does, um, as our state does with Executive Order 80, um, and, and Joe Biden's, um, President elect Biden's efforts uh, at the federal level. One thing we've been really excited to see is the idea um, of the incoming Biden administration to integrate climate into every part of government. And that's something we would really like to see. So for example, when uh, we've heard a little about the NC First Commission and how they're looking at transportation funding, it's been our view that climate, This is if we're going to take a moment now to rethink our transportation funding system, we have to do that with climate in mind. So how does all this relate to transit? Well, it's not super straightforward. It's not just like we build a lot of transit, we're going to solve the climate crisis. It's more complicated than that. We have to be thinking about integrating our transit systems with land use, as we've heard everyone talk about today, um, so that we're building cities and communities that uh, people have shorter commutes in the first place, that we're not relying on these old patterns of sprawl and you know, 45 minute single um, passenger commutes to work, which really have fueled the climate crisis in the Southeast. The second point I'll just raise very briefly that is really interwoven with all of this is environmental justice and equity. So we are really trying to think about all of these things um, together. And we hosted a forum about this time last year called um, Transportation Climate and Equity and looked at how all of these things link together because we want to be sure that when we're building this resilient uh, transportation system that is heavily focused on transit, we are making sure that it is inclusive and that we are using this opportunity to solve systemic problems of racism and environmental racism that have existed across the Southeast for so long. So I think we're at a very important juncture right now where our transportation system and funding system has been failing. We're going to need to replace it. That is true at the federal, at the state, at the local levels. And when we do so, we have to make sure that climate and equity are front and center. And we look forward to continuing the work um, with groups like Sustain Charlotte. One thing that we love to be able to do is work um, at the state and the federal level, but then use our relationships with folks like MAG on the ground to help leverage the messages and, and the, and the um, action that needs to be taken to really get things done. And that's just fantastic. So I am excited about what the next few years will bring. I think it's gonna be a lot of change um, and I think it's gonna have co-benefits throughout our communities. Thank you, Kim, for your work to really center these transportation issues in climate justice, in racial equity justice. I'd now like to introduce Tariq Kiley. Tariq works at Sustain Charlotte as the coordinator of the brand new Charlotte Regional Transportation Coalition. And he's gonna speak for a few minutes about the launch event, actually the launch party next Wednesday. My name is Tariq. I am the coordinator for the Charlotte Regional Transportation Coalition, where we seek to effectively advocate for an equitable, safe, 
sustainable transportation system that improves accessibility and mobility for all of Charlotte and surrounding area residents. We are in the process of growing and we want to invite you to be part of that growth. We hope you'll be able to join us for an official launch on Wednesday, December 9th from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. We promise that you will enjoy it. We'll have interviews, we'll have some entertainment and it'll be informative as well. Thank you so much, Tariq. And all of these links, including the registration for that event will be sent to you all in a follow-up email. And I have one, one short announcement before we get to questions and answers. Um, there is, so if we go to the, the next slide. Okay, so uh, Sustain Charlotte serves on the, the Technical Advisory Committee for a very important regional planning process called Connect Beyond. I mentioned earlier that the work that we do does not stop at the city limits or the county limits. We're really supporting the effort to look at regional, truly regional transit. And the Connect Beyond team would love your input on where you would like to see high capacity transit corridors that can take you different, lo different destinations like work, school, medical services, entertainment, and other destinations. So again, this link will be included in your follow-up email tomorrow, but we encourage you to take that survey. There's a whole, whole virtual online meeting and they will be uh, raffling off 10, uh, oh, sorry, $500 Visa gift cards. So if you, if you participate, you have a, a chance of winning that. And if we go to one more slide, there is a live Facebook Live uh, meeting about Connect Beyond and the future of high capacity transit on December 10th, which is next Thursday at 2.30 p.m. So again, we'll include that link in your follow-up email. So now we're gonna move into a few minutes of questions and answers. We may go over by just, just a few minutes, no, no more than five minutes. And you'll, you'll type the, the questions into the chat box. And I know that we're gonna have, we have more questions already than we have time to answer. Rest, rest assured, we are capturing everything that's in the chat and I will be sharing that with all of our panelists. So they will be able to uh, see all of the, the comments and questions that you've shared. And Eric will be reading some of the questions and our, our speakers can unmute themselves as they wish to answer the questions. Yes, sorry about that. Just as uh, it's time for questions and answers, uh, my dog was barking in the background. So hopefully that's last uh, of that. But uh, one of the first questions goes back a little bit further and I'm not sure because um, uh, Ms. Uh, Alma is not here, but I think it deals with the 80-20 rule. Um, it feels unbalanced and unfair to public trans uh, transit infrastructure. How uh, can we work to modify this outdated policy? And that was from Jamie. I'm not sure if anybody could answer uh, on the panel. Um, I guess it could be more of a state. How do we work with the state? And I know Julie, this put you on the spot, but um, with working with the state to change some policies that uh, make it harder for us to um, get funding for transit. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that would help tremendously is to have the cap lifted of the 10% um, limit to the state funding any of the transit um, initiatives. So, you know, that's all a negotiation. I mean, right now, the localities know that they have to carry the burden of the financing request because there is that 10% gap. Uh, cap at the state level and you know at the federal level i'd love to see the federal government increase their share but it, right now we would just love to see the federal government come up with an infrastructure plan that included transit we have a, another question from charles how do we ensure uh that those uh, folks who need transit uh, the most are located near, uh, say like the silver line, the gold line uh, is actually affordable uh, and mixed income housing. Let me take part of that, Eric. Um, at, at sitting on MTC, the one thing that we have, had, have tried to do is, is identify those folks that are that are further than a short walk away from a transit stop. And, and, and for those folks, we, we have experimented with, with different types of ride share programs 
Lyft and Uber and things like that that would identify people so they could get a, a drastically discount, discounted ride share or something that would put them within within the reach of uh, a stop because that, that's the thing about it. I mean, our, the corridors that are developing like within the city for, for the blue line and things like that, that's great the way it bisects the county, but to, to get to those stops from, you know, Northeast Charlotte or, or Ballantyne or things like that are, are, are difficult. So, you know, to, to have something that, that, that would identify the ability to pick up the phone and call somebody and, and, and have a, a shuttle or a ride share that would take you to the, the closest stop. Uh, but again, this is something that, that uh, you know, we're working on as we go. It's kind of like we're flying the plane as or we're, you know, we're flying the plane as we're building it. And I'll add to what Mayor Knox was saying that um, I think one of the other things, at least in Charlotte, is when we look at the silver line, is that it, there's we've had conversations about whether or not we can use transportation dollars to purchase land um, that is right away for the light rail that then can be used to build affordable housing. And that is, um, you know, the trick, the tricky part of that is that we don't, we, we don't qualify for that federal funding until we get to a certain point along the engineering and design of the light rail. And we're getting closer, but this, the flip side of that is as soon as we get that close and we have um, formalized the alignment of the rail, then the private sector also knows where that is gonna go. And, you know, I, it'd be great to have more involvement with the private sector to acquire that land and hold on to it for affordable housing to, um, for development. Um, because by the time government gets ready to buy it, um, the price is either shot up or it's just not, you know, it's hard for us to make those kinds of acquisitions, but we didn't really take full advantage of that on the blue line. And we know that. And I think with the silver line, that would be a tremendous uh, coup if we could do that well. Okay, uh, I have a, another question here. Uh, this is from Petra on Facebook. Uh, will there be more apartment complexes who will uh, require non-car ownership, like the one that was just recently um, passed? Well, that that one, um, you know, I'd love to think so, but that one was a really tough one to get passed, as you know. And we had... Um, a developer and a landowner, I was involved in that one from the beginning. We had a, a landowner who really wanted to see something transformational on that piece of land. He had the opportunity to sell that before. Um, and he worked with a developer who's uh, Clay Grubb, who's local. I mean, Clay has wrote, written a book recently about urban development and making it accessible and equitable for people. And so it was really you know, fantastic to have those two parties who were doing it for the right reason and wanted to bring equity to neighborhoods. Um, originally, they proposed having a certain number of those units only for seniors that lived in that neighborhood. So, yeah, we'd love to have more of that kind of partnership. And Eric, let me let me add one thing on that, too, because I, I, I think the big thing in, in, in a project like that you've taken that assertive effort to destigmatize what public transportation is all about. That's, you know, uh, the, the, the anomaly of, of saying, I'm gonna get on a city bus in New York City. is like, why would you ever get on a bus in New York City? That, that destigmatize, to destigmatize that to, in today's world is so important moving forward. So to have somebody that's willing to to go to bat on a project that says there's not going to be any cars because we're going to utilize public transportation speaks volumes on what public transportation really is, and 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 it's it's no longer um, just the bus. You know, it, it's no longer. Uh, you know, it's when we go to Charlotte, we love hopping on public transportation, but we got to drive in our car to get to Charlotte. To utilize it. So uh, again, I, 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 I can't sing praises enough on cats for, for, for what they've done for the community thus far, 
in, in promoting uh, the public transit sector uh, for all people throughout the county and, and regionally, you know, we're, we're talking to Cabarrus County now, we're talking to Gaston County now. The conversation has been ongoing with Iredale when we're going into South Carolina with conversations now so in Union County. So uh, again, it, it's truly regional, but it, it's, it's that process of de-stigmatizing public transportation, I, I think is, is one thing that we've done a very good job on here and we need to continue to. Thank you, Rusty. Um, I think we could take uh, maybe one more question. I know we're already a little over. Um, let's see. Uh, I know this one has been a theme for Charlotte, but um, affordable housing and gentrification. But uh, what are some of the protections for low income areas against uh, gentrification as Charlotte's transit corridors are growing and spreading? You know, that's the biggest challenge is, is if any of us could figure out how to um, how to work with development in a way that doesn't um, push people out of their neighborhoods and and, you know, because that's really what gentrification is. It's long term residents can no longer afford to live there. Um, I mean, transportation is a big one. It, um, the more public transportation you have, the more areas there are that do become affordable and accessible. And so it, you know, I, I don't know that gentrification has to happen in that sense, but, um, I, you know, there, there's more that goes into it than just transportation. It's about, it's about helping um, entrepreneurs, people of color that live in those neighborhoods to be able to develop businesses in those neighborhoods. We're doing a lot of that right now on the Beatty's Ford Road corridor. Um, we're, you know, partnering with local entrepreneurs who have lived there and who are uh, developing black businesses. And, and so there's a lot of the community uh, effort that goes into it that as well that has to happen that local government just can't do. I wish we had a I wish we had a perfect answer for that because that's a tough one. Yes, Julie, that that is uh, definitely a tough one. I just would add that um, Austin, because they just passed their referendum and are going to be expanding their transit network, uh, you know, added some uh, money for affordable housing. And they're also working with, uh, like you said, partnerships, the University of Texas to uh, use their anti-displacement toolkit. So that might be something we could uh, look at as a city moving forward. We'll include a link to that anti-displacement toolkit. I think it's a, a, a very interesting resource. Thank you so much to all of our amazing speakers. We really appreciate the work that you do and for sharing your time and, and insights with us today. Thank you for all of you attending. We know that there's a lot of work still to be done on transit, not only to get over the immediate challenges exacerbated by the, the pandemic, but also to really transform Charlotte and the entire country into a place where owning a car is an option rather than a necessity to live a full life. So thank you again to everyone and keep an eye on your inbox tomorrow for a follow-up email with all of the links, including a link to a recording of this presentation. Stay healthy and have a great night. Take care. Thanks, Mary.